your name in the land that is plentiful where streams of abundance flow blessed be your name
Hear the prayer that I cry out in the night As darkness falls around me Bring your holy light Lord, I lift my hands up to you Lay my burdens down before you Bring healing with the rising of the sun Let the morning bring a song from above Let the morning bring word of your great love May the glory of the sunrise give honor to our King let all creation sing. Let the morning bring. May your spirit come and guide my way. Show your grace and mercy to me every day. Lord, I come and draw near to you. Loving everything about you, my hope restored with the rising of the sun. Let the morning bring a song from above. Let the morning bring word of your great love. May the glory of the sun rise. Give honor to our King. Let all creation sing. Let the morning bring. Behold the glory of the morning star. A love forever near, never far. shadow of your wings you're the reason that I see let the morning breathe let the morning bring a song from above let the morning bring word of your great love may the glory of the sunrise give honor to our king let all creation sing let the morning bring hear the song that we sing and let the morning bring I want to read to you a passage in the Old Testament written by Moses near the end of his life. As Moses is coming to the passing from this life to the next, he was saying some things that he thought were very important for the people to remember after he was gone. And so it's within this context that he is speaking to his followers about the simplicity of the commands of God. And he doesn't want them to complicate the issues at hand, which is possible. But Moses is saying here, it's simpler than you're making it. It's not as complicated as you would like it to be in your minds, oh Israel. Don't, don't make this more complicated than it is. And so he reads this and then Paul picks up his words later in the book of Romans and so I want to read to you from the Old Testament and then in just a few minutes from the New Testament and then we'll go home. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 11 through 16. For this is the commandment which I command you today. It is not too mysterious for you nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that you may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, 
who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. And that command I give you uh, today uh, to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. Amen. So Moses is saying to them, listen, the Lord wants to go with you. He wants to bless you. He wants you to have life and not death. He wants you to have good and not evil. And so a blessed life, a good life, a life with the presence of God in it, it is not a mystery to achieve. It's not that difficult to get to. It's not that hard to obtain. And so in chapter, in verse 12, he says, you don't have to go to heaven to get it. You don't have to say, who shall ascend unto heaven to achieve the life that God wants you to have? He said, it's not that difficult. Salvation is not that complicated. In the Bible, in that culture, uh, men were and women were constantly thinking that uh, the greatest secrets, the greatest things to know, great wisdom was in heaven. It was in locked boxes in heaven. And if you wanted to know the great secrets, if you wanted to know the mysteries of the universe, you had to get somebody to reach up to heaven to be able to bring it down to you on earth. And so when the kings would go off the war, what would they do? They would assemble all of their wise men, and the wise men would do incantations, and they would maybe cut themselves and, and burn fires and incense, and hoping that they would hear something from heaven, a bit of wisdom from heaven. In fact, when King Saul departs from the Lord and no longer serves the Lord, he still wants to hear from heaven. And so instead of going to King or going to Samuel, the prophet, who could give him a word from heaven, a word from the Lord, he goes to the witch of Endor and she burns incense in, in hopes of reaching out to Samuel, who he believes is in heaven at that time. But great wisdom, great insight was always in heaven. It was always out of reach. It's interesting that when Paul in Acts chapter 26 talks to King Agrippa, and he's testifying to Agrippa. Agrippa says some famous words. He said, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian. But there's, in the Greek, there's a question mark there, or, or, or it's, it's in the form of a question. He's looking at Paul and saying, Paul, you're intelligent. I'm intelligent. Do you think that in an hour of talking to me about God, that you could persuade me so quickly, almost thou persuadest me. Do you think you could persuade me so quickly, Paul? Paul, it's more complicated than that. You're simplifying something that's mysterious. You and I live in a complicated culture. We complicate almost everything in our culture. You have to go to school for 20 years to even know how to live in our culture. It's that complicated. Even things like male and female are complicated. Now it's LGBT, QRZ, HIJK. I don't know what it is. I don't know how many different uh, things you can be in our culture, but it's no longer male and female. It's more complicated than all that for us. Even child raising. It's complicated. You go down to Barnes and Noble. Do you know how many books are there about child rearing? It's so complicated to raise Junior anymore. I love the old uh, poem that Vance Havner uh, wrote. And uh, I think he wrote it. I used to quote it. But I think I've used it before. But I found it uh, in my notes today. I, I thought I'd read it to you. It goes like this. Junior bit the meter maid. Junior kicked the cook. Junior's antisocial, according to the book. Junior smashed the clock and lamp. Junior hacked the tree. Destructive trends are treated in chapter 2 and chapter 3. Junior threw his milk at mom. Junior screamed for more. Notes on self-assertiveness are found in chapter 4. Junior tossed his shoes and socks out into the rain. 
negation, that is normal, disregard the stain. But Junior got in Grandpop's room and tore up his fishing line. Well, that's to gain attention, see page 89. But Grandpa sees the slipper and he yanked Junior across his knee, for Grandpa hadn't read a book since 1893. <laughs> it's complicated. Everything's complicated in our culture. Marriage is complicated. You go down the self-help aisle, there's hundreds of books that you can buy on marriage. And it's insane how much uh, wisdom you think, if you looked at those shelves, how much wisdom you need to hold a marriage together. But you know what? It's not that simple. It's not that complicated. Pardon me. It can't be that complicated. And in fact, if you can't find a way to simplify something, you'll never be good at it. You won't. Uh, my uh, little grandma on my mom's side, she was a sweet little woman, and she was married to a guy, and we loved him, but man, he was a stinker. I, I would not want to have pastored my grandpa. It would have been miserable. I'd have resisted. <laughs> Resign. I couldn't have, uh, maybe one or two of them, but five or ten of them would have driven a pastor nuts. And uh, he was a cantankerous old guy, and his main goal when we went to visit him was keeping us from slamming doors. And if he slammed the door, he'd yell across the, the, uh, the house. Uh, I remember visiting him once. We were staying the night, and we were watching a football game, and at 8 o'clock, uh, that was a... Uh, Back when uh, the game started a little earlier, uh, he turned off the TV at 8 o'clock, halftime, and said, all right, everybody go to bed. And it's like everybody had to go to bed because he was going to bed. And it's a miserable thing to stay with him because you're laying there from 8 to 12 looking at the ceiling in his house waiting to hear the old man snore. It was an awful house that he ran, but my little grandma... Man, she loved that old guy. And, uh, but, 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 but they weren't intelligent. Uh, or, or they were intelligent. They weren't educated like some of us are, I guess. But they knew enough to keep a marriage together for 60 plus years. And, and, and she would simplify it. She would always say two things about marriage. Anytime you wanted to have advice on marriage, she would say, well, don't fight for anything because if you have to get it by fighting for it, you won't enjoy it once you've got it. And then she would say, out of sight, out of mind. Out of sight, out of mind. Uh, my mom uh, and dad were married, and dad would go off and work, uh, you know, weeks away. And mom was worried about whether there were women in the hotel room where he was at. And, and grandma would just say, out of sight, out of mind. Don't worry about what, what he's doing out there. When he gets home, throw your arms around him, love him. Don't ask what's going on out there. Just out of sight, out of mind. And you say, that's crazy. Well, it worked for her for 60 years. <laughs> it worked. She didn't read no book, but she had simplified marriage. I remember E.V. Hill, who was one of the great preachers in our country, and uh, he simplified marriage like this. He said, when he and his wife, they would be laying there, whoever woke up first would wake the other one up by kissing them. And, and he said he woke up once and he looked over and there his wife was and she was laying with her eyes wide open. And he said, what's wrong? And she said, did you put the check in the bank? And uh, he said, listen, I'm going to close my eyes and you close your eyes and then I'm going to open my eyes and you'll be kissing me and then I'll get up my clothes on and I'll go out and rob a bank for you. <laughs> How about that? But they simplified it. They made it work. Listen, and, and I'm rambling here for a minute, but, but I'm talking to somebody. Uh, there are people in this room who have been married for 40, 50, 60 years. And if you're thinking about getting married, go up to them and ask them, what book did you read to keep your marriage together that long? And they're going to laugh at you because they didn't read no book to keep their marriage together, except maybe the Bible, 40, 50, 60 years. It wasn't that complicated for them. They simplified it. And you know what? Christianity can be complicated for you. 
You can make it difficult. You can, you can make it uh, an issue of the greatest questions in the world. But listen, Moses is saying it's not that complicated. It's not that simple. You don't have to go to heaven to get it. It's not that big of a mystery to know how to have a blessed, good, God-filled life. It's not that complicated. I remember hearing a missionary, and, and he had come back to America, and he'd been uh, in Africa for over 20 years. Young man comes up to him. He's in college, and he says, I want to talk to you about the faith. I have a lot of questions that are on my mind. And the missionary, uh, retired missionary, said, well, come and see me. The guy comes and sees him. And the, the, he starts telling him all of these questions, which are the big questions of the faith. And the missionary just sort of slows him down and says, now, listen, I'm going to answer all of your questions that, that you're asking me. But just understand, I spent over 20 years in a place with people that know far less about Christianity and God than you do, but they knew enough to have their lives transformed. All right? So I'm going to answer these questions, but know this. You know enough. It's not that complicated. And so Moses, again, is saying, listen, it's not that complicated. You don't have to go to heaven. You don't have to go to a witch doctor to get the wisdom you need to live a blessed life. And not only that, he says, it's not that hard. He says, who would say, verse 13, who would say, let's go across the ocean to get it? He said, who will ascend into heaven, verse 12, verse 13, nor is it beyond the sea. And again, in that day, and you've read some of those stories, uh, Anything of value, you had to go on an epic journey to get. And so, for instance, you have Jason and the Argonauts, where Jason wants control of the kingdom, and he joins up with the Argonauts, and they sail across the sea to get the golden fleece, and they, they have many trials and tribulations on the sea. Homer's Odyssey would be another story of a person who travels far to achieve something. In our day and age, you have Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail. In other words, they would say to get something valuable, you have to really work and strive and push yourself to get it. You know, Martin Luther, the great Martin Luther believed that. And, and in Catholicism that he grew up, they would, uh, you know, uh, Martin Luther believed you had to go to the convent and you had to study hard and you had to put yourself into severe physical dejection and you had to climb the stairs up uh, there in Rome on your knees. You, you had to really work hard to get God's wisdom in your life. But again, Moses is saying it's not in heaven. It's not beyond the sea. It, it's here. It's in your heart. It's near to you. Obey the commandments of the Lord. The Lord has told you what to do. Just do what God has told you to do. If God is the king of your life, if he's Lord, that's all you need to have a blessed life. Now, Paul jumps on that in Romans chapter 10, verse 8 and 9. Let's put these up. This is verse 14. So Paul was referencing Deuteronomy chapter 30. He says, but what does it say? What does Deuteronomy 30 say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which is preached. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's keep this verse up for a while, Bill. Look at this. Paul is saying, yeah, Moses, it's not that hard. It's not that hard to be blessed of God. It's not that hard to live a good life. It's not that hard to be saved. He says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, period. That's it. It's not that complicated. Now, you have to believe that God raised him from the dead. In other words, you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. 
You have to believe that God elevated him, that the Father has raised him up, that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, that he was raised from the dead, and you have to confess the Lord Jesus. Now, you know there's a hook in that because it doesn't say, again, and we talked about this a few weeks ago in Celebrate Recovery, it doesn't say confess that Jesus is the Savior. A lot of times people come and say, Lord, save me. Jesus, save me. You see the brokenness in my life. You see the hurt in my life. Save me. Deliver me. Help me. But, but, but listen, you need to confess that Jesus is Lord. He's Lord. If he's not Lord, he, he can't be your Savior because the way he saves you is by being your Lord. If he's not your boss, how can he save you? If you're not going to listen to what he's saying and telling you to do, you're not going to be saved because the way that he saves you is he tells you what to do. So if you're not going to listen to him and obey him, if he's not going to be your Lord, he can't be your Savior. You can't have him as Savior and him not be Lord. He's Savior by being your Lord. But he says, if he will be your Lord, if you will confess that he is boss, and if you believe that he was raised from the dead, you can be saved. You can be, live a blessed life. The question is, is he your boss? Are you willing to say, you're just not the Lord of the universe? You're my Lord. You're my boss. You're my daddy. I told them in CR, I was talking to Maria, my third child. She's three. And we're sitting around talking, and I was just playing around with her. And I said, Maria, who's your daddy? And she said, I not know. And, uh, <laughs> and I had talked with her mother that she needs to set her daughter right about who her daddy is. And, uh, but being, uh, saying that the Lord is, uh, that saying Jesus is Lord is saying, Jesus, you're my daddy. You're the boss. You're in charge of my life. And Jesus would put it this way in Matthew 11. He would say, take my yoke upon you. Put my yoke upon you. Let me be the one who's steering you. Now, it's interesting that when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, the implied there is that we are all wearing a yoke. It's not that you're not being controlled by anything. It's not that you're ever free and that now God wants to control your life. The Bible says that we're always being controlled by something anyway, so why not let Jesus Christ control you and lead you to a blessed life? You're always being controlled by something. Some of us are being controlled by our past. We are. The things that were said to us, our childhood, the trauma of our child the way we were raised, the things that were done to us, the way we were treated in high school, the way that we were treated in the first marriage. The, there are things in our life that can bind us, that can control us. Many people are really being controlled by their past and they don't fully understand that. Others are being controlled by other people and people have uh, dominion over them. They're out to people please. They they are really under the control of those whose favor that they want. They're out to do anything to be accepted. They're out to fit in. They're being controlled by people. Others are being controlled by, by, by their passions. And they've allowed addiction into their life. And those addictions are really governing where they go, what they do, what they spend their money on, how they live, how they function in society. Others are being controlled by their pride, and they're driven by the uh, desire to achieve, to look good in the culture, to have people say nice things about them. They're driven by their egos. But everybody's controlled by something. It can be the past. It can be people. It can be passions. It can be pride. But everybody is wearing some kind of a yoke. What well, Jesus says, listen, he says to you and I, Wear my yoke because my yoke is easy and my burden is light.
the Bible says. Listen, again, he's saying, and, and I'm driving this home and I'm being repetitive, but, but listen, Moses says and Paul says, it's not a mystery. It's not that complicated to live in a blessed life. It's not that hard to be saved and on your way to heaven. It's not something that you have to cross the mountains to find. It's not something you have to go across the oceans to achieve. It's not something you have to climb up to heaven to bring down. It's here. It's in your heart. If the Lord uh, Jesus, if you'll confess the Lord Jesus and admit that he was raised from the dead, you can be saved. It's that simple. It's not that complicated. Now, when I was wrestling with Christianity. I was raised in the preacher's family again, and uh, I, I think most of you know that. And at, at the age of 17, uh, round about there, the Lord began to really talk to me. I'd never made a profession of faith, although I, I, I'd been on the church pew, and I think a lot of people thought that I was a Christian. Um, I, I remember doing something uh, when I was uh, about 15, and a guy got mad at me. I, I, said a, I said a bad word, <laughs> and he said, I can't believe a Christian would say something like that. People just assumed I was a Christian because I was always in church, but I had to go to church. My dad was a pastor. I was always there. I took my Bible. For some reason, I like, I, I like to study the Bible because I like to win arguments with other religious people. There was an ego there. And people just assumed that I was a believer, but I wasn't. And the Lord began to talk to me when I was late 16, early 17. And I just began to wrestle with that. And, and, and I had to struggle with that until finally I, I, I surrendered. And I came to the Lord and I said, Jesus you are Lord of my life. Whatever you want out of my life, you can have it. Now, here's the thing. When I was struggling with that, I was all messed up because I thought, oh, man, I'm going to have to finally give in. It never dawned on me that it was an honor that Jesus would want to come into my life and bless me and walk with me and be my friend. And that, that's the great deception that maybe the devil has you under today. That, oh man, to say Jesus is Lord, this is going to hurt. This is going to be painful. You don't see it as an honor. But Jesus again says, come in me, all ye who are weak and weary, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's an invitation to have him as boss, not a burden. I remember my wife and I. She's here, so I, I, I got to tell you the edited version of all this. I got to, I got, I got to, no. Um, I, but, but I remember when we were dating, and we had dated for a while, and there were several things that happened when we were dating, but, but I remember being in the presence of, of another couple. Uh, the girl was there, and there was somebody else, and they asked her, they were engaged, and somebody asked this girl who was engaged, um, why are you guys getting married now? And she said, well, you know the rule. Uh, if you date two years, you either get married or break up, so we're going to get married. And, uh, and we had been dating a while. It's like, uh-oh, I didn't know there was a rule. It's, time's closing in on me as well. And, and I was wrestling with, boy, do I want to give up my freedom? Man, because, you know, marriage... I mean, it could go bad. I mean, you could lose all your stuff, you know. And uh, I mean, do, do I really want to? Do I really want to step in to this marriage? And, and then there came a moment of clarity when I was able to look at my girlfriend at the time, and, 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 and you know what? I, I thought she's such a wonderful person. Why am I fighting this? If she wants me. What kind of insanity am I going through to say, boy, I don't, I don't know if I want her. I don't know if I want to give up my freedom. If somebody as wonderful like that wants me, what's taking me so long? How stupid am I? 
And I stepped into that, and, and, and it was the best decision I've ever made except for Jesus Christ. It's working out so far. Now, whether I'll say that in 10 years, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, it's a good decision, uh, great decision. Uh, she's a wonderful person, a loving person. Now, listen to me. Jesus Christ says, come unto me. And again, what Satan wants to do, and maybe we, again, give him too much credit. Maybe it's something inside of us that's insane. What Satan wants to do is to say, ooh, you don't want to come under the lordship of Jesus. That could be tough, man. You could lose everything you got. You don't know what he's going to ask you to do. Man, that, that, could, that could be rough on you. But if Jesus is offering you uh, his friendship, if he's saying, come unto me, if you'll do what I'm telling you to do, I'll bless you, I'll keep you, I'll give you a good life, I'll be there for you, I'll break all the other bonds in your life, if you'll come under me, I'll break the power of your past, I'll break the power of people in your life, the power of passions, I'll even break the power of the pride that controls you in your life, I'll free you from all of that, and you can come into my existence, I'll put my yoke up on you, and it'll be the lightest thing you've ever worn in your life, come unto me. If he's giving us that offer, why are we saying no to that? Why are we continually wrestling with, I don't know if I want to come under him. I don't know if I want a Lord. Listen, you already have a Lord. He's the best Lord you'll have. It's not that complicated. Some of you today have been maybe in an abusive situations and you've had people who have run over you. Maybe you had parents who were very domineering Maybe you were in a marriage with a person who didn't let you do anything, who was just very controlling. Listen to me. That's not Jesus Christ. That's not Jesus Christ. He wants to be your Lord so that he can bless you. He wants to give you eternal life. He wants to give you peace so that you never go to bed uh, and lay down afraid that you'll die again in your sleep. He wants to give you a, a deep contentment in life. He wants to ease you of your worry. He wants to ease you of your burden. He wants to go with you in the darkest places in life. He wants to bless you. He wants to be so close to you and you feel his love that you really aren't craving the love of others as much as you used to. He wants to be so close to you that you don't crave the approval of people like you used to. He wants to free you. And it's not that complicated, the Bible says. Now, psychology will tell you, and I'm not against psychology, but listen, to be free and to be whole and to be blessed doesn't take 10 years of laying on somebody's couch. Moses says, and Paul says, it's not that far from you. It's here. Confess that Jesus is Lord and that he was raised from the dead and you will be saved. And saved doesn't mean then. Saved is something you have now. He wants to save you from damage now and from damnation in the future. But the salvation starts now. He wants to do that in your life. Will you stand with me? Somebody here who's complicating it. You're listening to your college professors, and I know they're smart. I know they're bright, but they're not brighter than Moses, and they're not brighter than Paul, and they're not brighter than Jesus. And all of those three guys said, it's simple. And I don't know who you're listening to, Dr. So and so. I got a doctorate too. That doesn't mean you're smart. But Jesus is saying, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. It's not in heaven. You don't have to go across the sea to get it. It's right here. It's, it's, it's in your grasp. If you'll say, Jesus, you're Lord of my life. You're just not Lord of the universe, but I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to break every other yoke in my life. I want to be only yours. I want to be controlled by only you. Man, that's music to his ears. He'll do that. That's what he wants to hear from you. Tell him, Lord Jesus, I believe you are raised from the dead. 
and you can be saved today. It's that simple. You say, well, what about all that other stuff? What about those verses? What, what, what about the life I should live? Listen, no, no, no. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. You're Lord Jesus and you are raised from the dead. You will be saved. Will you come? Will you come? Let's sing together. Maybe there's somebody who wants to come and pray for a lost loved one. We need to have a soul burden on our hearts. We need to see those who are lost around us. Maybe there's somebody who wants to pray today. Will you come? Let's sing together. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God.
my righteousness. 